and welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I'm your host, DK, and with me today, we have back uh, Long Live Lou. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, welcome back <laughs> to the show. That I think that so was the most... Yeah, yeah, I was about to say, I think that's like the worst like response to an intro I've ever done. Yeah, <laughs> I just well, kind of froze. <laughs> welcome back. Thank you. Um, yes, dude, we had... Um, we had, uh, this is the first time you've been back since that big 1 million download special that we had, which was really oh, cool. You're right. Yeah. You that like one was that. actually fun to do. Yeah. I, I've actually, I kind of feel bad about it, but I also think it was funny that we made you the scapegoat of that episode. I'm okay with that. I'm totally, <laughs> it was, dude, it was I'm, that dynamic was really good, actually. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, uh, this is going to sound so stupid. But I will happily be the butt of a joke to make the things go smoothly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like and it's the like, show went smoothly because I was willing to be the butt of the joke. And it's funny too because it's like we all agreed that you were going to be the butt of the joke, which Before also I was made even it like the butt not, of the joke. Yeah, yeah. Which so so it's like because of that, like it was like we were all in on a joke. Like yeah. we all knew that any time that we were like booing you, it's like because. It was like, that was part of the joke versus like, yeah. it wasn't very personal. Like we weren't yeah. actually booing you. It's like, yes, yes, this is working. Boo me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, take yeah. your which, booze. Which, which also opens the door for you to say the most outrageous jokes that you wouldn't be <laughs> exactly. able to say if you there, weren't the butt of the joke. You know? <laughs> there was a couple of times where I had to like not say something. <laughs> yeah. There was a couple of times that I'm like, mm, no, I don't but think the sponsors allowed- will like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's funny because like uh, yeah I think I was like a really good I don't know I don't like uh, I don't necessarily like making fun of people but I, I I just find the interesting dynamic of that that was fun yeah that was really fun that was a good night in general I think that was really well done you know and it's Congrats kind of funny because I've I've always had uh, the rule if you can't laugh at yourself you're not allowed to laugh at others. Um, and this weekend, um, I did a couple shows at the exhibit again. Um, we went to San Jose and then Vegas, yes, uh, not yesterday, two days ago. Um, and, uh, there was like the comedically polarizing experience of engineers, right? There was like this one guy who's like the system tech and he has a ponytail, shorts, black shirt. His shirt is tacked into his shorts, which is always a weird outfit. Uh, where's the glasses? And he's just like, he just straight face eyeballs you and you're just like, Hey, how's it going? He's like, hi, what what do you want? I'm like, God damn, dude. Like you are the atypical description of a live sound engineer. Jesus (laughs) fucking Christ. Oh, then I go to, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, um, I go to front of house cause I was doing front of house for the show. And, uh, I talked to the guy and I'm like, Hey, what's going on? And he's like, how you doing? I'm like, Hey, you know, just have an itch in my ass. And he's like, you want me to scratch it for you? I was like, if you would, he's like, yeah, go ahead. And I was like, I like this guy. I like him. If you can joke around with each other like this, like, you know, it's going to be a good time. Hell yeah. You know, the boys are hetero when they're making deep gay jokes. Dude. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> oh, I told my uncle about, um, the, the deeply closeted, uh, joke. Oh, the Mark. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Norm, Norm McDonald. Norm joke. McDonald. Yeah, so uh, I went to my parents' house. He was there, and he's like, "Hey, Louis, how you been?" I was like, "Man, I've been good. You know, just uh, you know, just all kinds of new things." He's like, "What kind of new things?" I'm like, "Well, I'm gay." He's like, "I'm." He's like, "What?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm very closetedly gay." And he's like, <laughs> "Wait, so you're gay?" I'm like, "No, I'm closeted." gay like I'm, I'm in the closet he's like so you're gay then and I was like no 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 see a closeted gay man would never admit to being gay so I'm deeply closeted so I'm then telling he, you he, I'm not gay yeah and he's like I don't get it and I showed him the video and he's like he said that on TV <laughs> what, what did you show him the video of Diddy saying that no I'm just kidding no Diddy <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> Love. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the the clips of uh, Diddy like just doing any regular interview, and then all of a sudden it's just the Law and Order <laughs> SVU. <laughs> law and Order. Diddy it's Files. like what are what are the misconceptions about you? <laughs> there are no misconceptions. <laughs> dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, anyway, let's get into this show. I think this episode will be fun because uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the role of creativity in engineering. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is interesting because obviously art is a creative endeavor. 
But where are the lines of creativity? And we're going to talk about the nuance of that and the roles of creativity uh, within the role of, of within different roles in different parts of the process. Lou, you you talked about a tweet or a thread or something like that yeah. that someone wrote that you wanted um, to talk about. Yeah, I can actually read it. Uh, let me see here. Uh, replies, mentions, da la. Damn. Uh, okay, it's can you gone. Go off the top but, of your head? Yeah, yeah, I can I go, go off the top, top of my head. head. Basically, uh, the thread asked uh, artists and engineers, are we avoiding creativity if we all use the same uh, C800 into a 1073 into a CL1B chain? That was the question. Are we avoiding creativity when we use the quote unquote tried and true chain? The LA saw, chain. Yeah, I saw a couple of responses there that I agreed and some that just really didn't understand the question. Um, yeah. Some people thought that the question was, is the chain even good? That's not the question here. The chain, the, the chain is less of a factor. Um, that question was, are we avoiding creativity when we use something that, uh, let's say, is standardized or is the fixed chain in the studio rather than using all the other tools and resources we have at our fingertips? Okay. Are we avoiding creativity? By the way, I just have to say that any, any sort of like writing medium mm -hmm. like Thread and Twitter or X is kind of frustrating because that's when like, I, I don't think that people are dumb. I think that people are just really unable to articulate when I think that articulation is a learned skill. And mm -hmm. you can really so easily tell who spent the time learning how to articulate. <laughs> yeah. And then who, who, people, who people read a question that is point blank like gun, sh gun right to the head, and then fucking miss. <laughs> it's, it's like, like what's dude, your favorite you color? <laughs> I voted for Trump. It's like, okay, <laughs> what the fuck? I asked what your favorite color was. What does this, this have to is, do with this anything? This is what's wrong with people. This is what's wrong with people. It's like, brother, answer the goddamn question. Did you even read the question? <laughs> My favorite is when, uh, when. You know what the answer is. You just want them to say the answer because you know that they know what the answer is, but they're avoiding the answer because they don't want to say the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and like, it's so funny. did you trip? It's like, well, see, the, my shoe was untied. And it's like, I didn't ask if your shoe was untied. I asked if you tripped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or like the dude that's like, are you insecure about your tie height? And the, the guy that's getting interviewed is like, well, first off, I'm taller than you. And it's like, yeah. oh, so the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Your, your response said it all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Anyway, going to the question, is is that uh, avoiding? I like the word, I think, focusing... Uh, on the specific wording of avoiding is interesting. So that's, we're going to start here and kind of expand and blossom into mm -hmm. this topic of creativity with engineering. But what did you think, Lou? What was your thoughts on this? So I actually, I actually found the post. Um, I can actually read what I responded to that, um, which was uh, just so oh, I'm not Oh, you responded saying, to it. I responded to it. And just so oh, I'm not yeah. saying something different on the air than I'm writing in public, you know, I put, I don't see the issue in finding your own chain and sticking to it. But if your chain is a copy and paste of another, as long as it works, I don't think it works against creativity as that, as that more revolves around how you use the tool and not if the tool itself makes you uh, creative because it's different. I don't know. Most times if you ask a studio house guy, you, uh, why they used one mic or another, they they say because it was there and the reason i responded with that is because a lot of times creativity is usually not in the quality of a recording the quality of a recording can be a creative decision right we can choose to make it lower quality we can choose to make it higher quality and see how that actually plays a role in the record itself but let's say like in the context of the comment that I put, let's say you're the studio house guy, somebody booked a four hour block and they're just looking to retract the lead vocals to a record that's already been recorded at another studio. They just didn't like their take, but they just want a good, clean take. Cool. Using whatever is available there, as long as you know that it's a clean mic and everything, knowing that you can add delays, add reverbs, add distortion later and things of that nature that also add to the creativity of what you end up doing on the final record, you know, I don't think it's necessarily avoiding creativity, but rather doing the job itself. And that's where 
uh, I think some people misunderstood the question of, are we avoiding creativity or are we using the resources in front of us to get a proper recording so that we can then use our creativity elsewhere once we've got the takes? Because we have to make sure that we're managing the time we spend in the studio. If you're in a home studio and you're recording yourself as an artist, then I think you could side with the, you know, maybe you are avoiding creativity by not using the cheaper mic in your locker. You know, maybe that's the one you use on your ad libs because it distorts in a certain way and that's cool. You know, but if you're in a in a studio environment where you only have four hours to record your lead vocals and maybe you need a couple takes, maybe you need a break here and there just to rest your voice because you're doing a lot of like high shouting or something. You don't want your voice cracking towards the end of the record. You know, uh, it's less about the creativity at that point as an engineer. So I, I think depending on the roles, you know, the question can go either way, but my vote is we're not necessarily avoiding creativity, but allowing ourselves to get the job done so we can be creative at another point. Yeah, you kind of you kind of went ahead and uh, spoke on depending on the positions and like the relativity of the matter. But mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> but yeah, your initial argument was I really like the way that you phrased it um, when we were off air, which is like I think you said it again was like creativity is not in the tools, but how you use them. Yeah, a very it's, simple, a, it's a poor workman that blames his tools. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so it's like, um, hmm, it's, I find that to be quite true. Uh, it's like, are very you a good uncreate- engineer if yeah. you don't have uh, in one way, Asperger's? In one way, another anecdotal application of, of that sort of uh, mentality is like, who is more creative? The one that is able to mix with all third-party plugins with a ton of different plugins or the one that is able to mix with just the stock plugins? Yes. And it's like, it's the one that is able to do it with the least amount of plugins, right? That's the mm-hmm. more creative work. But that being said, um, it also can be limiting. But like limiting limitations can also breed creativity as we all understand and know. So mm-hmm. um, the point, the reason why I think this this is a valid question is... I think understanding our role in the creative process, especially as a professional, um, one thing's for sure, it is the artist's role to be creative like throughout the entire process, right? And then eventually, once the artist is able to and has the funds to, has the means to, is making enough money to be able to do so, which by the way, we could talk about this as a whole nother podcast episode. Eventually, a manager will come to the artist and help delegate the work that needs to be done and mm-hmm. remove the non, non-creative uh, processes so the artist can focus on the creative ones. Again, I think that the way that I said that was very specific and very important. The manager comes to the artist, not the other way around. If you go to a manager, this again, this is a whole nother podcast episode that we could spend an entire yeah. hour, uh, hour on. But typically, if you go to a manager, then you're fucked. You have no leverage. Um, and you're not doing, you're, you're gonna, they're not going to help in any way possible. Um, it's when they come to you begging to want to work with you, that's when you have the leverage. Okay, so I, I said that on purpose, right? Mm-hmm. But... Uh, that being said, depend on the as the engineer, as the producer, you are likely to be part of that creative process. Today, we found out that Quincy Jones passed away, right? Quincy oh, Jones yeah, was extremely, extremely creative with all the processes, mm-hmm. f- uh, fusion with jazz, and and then as well as with pop and stuff, and Brazilian mm-hmm. and and all sorts of forms of jazz and music, right? Like love Quincy mm-hmm. Jones, absolutely phenomenal. Rip, R.I.P. to him, right? But. Uh, so, so there's this like understanding that the producer is part of the creative process, especially nowadays when the producer roles have changed a little bit, especially like Quincy was like old school producer where he was bringing the musicians together mm-hmm. and creating fusions based on who he brought onto the team versus now producers can be like beat makers uh, or like a producer can also be a recording engineer that is part of the creative process, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it depends on the direction that you go with, but a producer in general is typically part of the creative process. So Mm -hmm. a producer might be able to mix, but if they're producing the record, they probably have a creative say in how the record should be mixed. Yeah. Right. Like if you're uh, working with Greg Wells, who Mm -hmm. is a producer and a mixer, probably has a bigger say, like 
how the record should be mixed alongside the artist, right? Mm -hmm. But he also just happens to have the skill to mix versus someone like Mandy Merriquin, who is famously known to not change too much or Mm -hmm. serve it, right? And they they recognize that they're not part of that creative decision and people are coming to them after the creative decisions have been already made. So it's like understanding your role um, as as a, an engineer slash producer for when you're, if you're running a one-stop shop in a non-music city where you are the producer, the engineer, the mixing engineer, the mastering engineer, you are everything for the artist. Mm-hmm. You are definitely part of the creative process. Where if you've niched down in a music city like Nashville or LA and you only do mastering, you only do mixing, you only do one thing and recording engineering, Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is heavily dependent on your relationship with the studio, the artist, and what you agreed upon before. For example, for me, most of the times, uh, I have a little bit of creativity involved, but at the same time, I recognize that it's if I am too creative or if I change the song too much, it goes against the 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 point, the process. I'm not or like with the recording engineer, especially the recording engineers, there's the balance of being effective and efficient with time versus being creative. Of course, yeah. to the engineer, they could be creative and like do mic shootouts and stuff, but that's just not practical. That kind of ruins and hinders the creativity of the artist, which is like needs to be done quick. It's trying to catch lightning in a bottle, right? Yeah. And if you spend too much time f- trying to be creative in it and which in the uh it can possibly hinder the the true form of creativity from the artist. So it's like recognizing your place. Like sometimes you just have to be efficient, right? You know, something uh, to pull from that, um something that some people might have already seen on social media getting passed around because I noticed it's been a popular thing again. Um when uh, Kanye did, uh, speaking of Manny, when Kanye did um, whatever, better, harder, faster, whatever the combination of words is, it's like playing checkers with that name. Um, but, you know, uh, the one where he sampled the Daft Punk record or not sampled or maybe he interpolated it or whatever. But um, he took the song, he had a DJ play it at the club and he's like, damn, my drums just aren't hitting as hard as I'd want them to. And he was trying to, you know, compete with Sexy Back by Timberland and Justin Timberlake. So he goes to Pharrell and he's like, dude, I got the record back from Pharrell doing the drums and it just didn't even feel like the same record anymore. I sent it to Swiss Beats and same thing. It just didn't feel like my record you know i sent it to these like top producers and so i'm like dude you know what i just got to go to timberland you know and somebody recommended he go talk to timberland timberland spends five minutes gets the record done and then spent the rest of the hour talking about how only he could have done that but i think the genius behind that interview was that kanye sent his record to have drums put on it that would just hit harder at the club he didn't want to change the record he just wanted it to hit harder and only Timberland was the one that recognized the assignment for that record. He didn't want all new drums. He didn't want a new vibe. He didn't want a new groove. He just wanted it to hit harder. So like you said, as an engineer, sometimes our creativity can be allowed in some aspects, but sometimes we're assigned a role, which is make it better. You know, stay within the creativity lines that we've already put in place. Yeah, so the role of creativity is is dependent. And I think that it is part of our job to recognize when we are supposed to be and to accept when we're not supposed to be. I think um, a big complaint with a lot of recording engineers is that they feel like they're just they're just manual button pushers. And sometimes... You can be, yeah. Yeah, sometimes that is your role, right? Especially yeah. as a recording engineer. Um, and sometimes, uh, but I think it's, I think in general, practically speaking, if you're working in a commercial studio, the assumption is that you are the button pusher unless they give you uh, permission to be part of the creative process beforehand. Because usually, especially with higher level engineering and stuff like that, if you suggest lyrics, if you turn around, suggest lyrics, or if you're turning around and like talking about creative decisions that while you're recording, um, it's not just a collaborative process, you become a liability because now they ha- might have to give you a point or they can, you can, you eventually might be able to have the grounds to sue them if they don't give you a point. Yeah. Right. So, um, they, it's also just practical from a business sense to keep everyone's hands clean. It's not that they don't want your advice, but they want to keep everyone's hands clean. Yeah. Play your role. Um, yeah. And everybody has a role to play. Uh, and I think that's really frustrating for a lot of people that are innately creative of like foundationally speaking, someone that is high in openness 
Mm-hmm. Um, to like shut up <laughs> and to just <laughs> do what you're told is very difficult for anyone that refused to get a regular job and decided to go the route of freelance and become an engineer. Um, mm-hmm. It takes a genuinely creative person to find the courage to uh, step away from a reliable job, uh, a reliable and consistent and, you know, a habitual job for, yeah. for something that is so chaotic like engineering, right? It does take a creative person. So it, it, it does make sense that people get frustrated, but I also think, um, and there's a lot of psychology behind this. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, I know some people really hate his guts for his politics. And, and so I, I'll recognize that, but from his, I really like Jordan Peterson's uh, thoughts on psychology. His influences are, he, he takes a lot from Nietzsche, and he won't admit it, but he takes a lot from Alfred Adler as well. Um, and obviously Carl Jung. But one of the thoughts that he says for the creative, typically those that are high in openness, um, first off, he, he references a study, and he says those that are high in openness typically have a correlation with, uh, a negative correlation with conscientiousness. So saying that those that are typically higher on the creative spectrum are less organized, less capable of doing um, day to day, like less capable of having a clean room, less capable of having a to-do list are typically more chaotic, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and if and in the opposite sense, if you are very creative and high in openness and also high in conscientiousness, very disciplined, able to stay on a task, be able to execute things, you are literally one in a million. Like that is actually a very rare combination of personality traits to have. And this is backed by data. Like it's the big five personality test is one of the few, maybe if I'm not mistaken, the only personality test that is actually backed by psychological findings and studies and data. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we've done an episode about this, about uh, the correlation between conscientiousness and openness. Um, anyway, uh, he says, um, so Jordan Peterson's thoughts, and, and regardless of what you think about him, I think his first book, 12 Rules for Life, is actually phenomenal. phenomenal. And I read that book during a time when I was really low uh, and I was very depressed and it was mm-hmm. so good for me. Um, I agree if you don't like him for his politics, sure. I, I think that that's okay to think, but I think it's uh, his psychological takes and his interpretations of past influences and past psychology um, is very uh, helpful, influential, empowering. Um, and so I think one of the steps that he says is that if you are high in openness and you find yourself to be very creative, you're going to struggle a lot. You're going to struggle a ton. This is, it's, it is a, it is a endeavor um, and a relationship with self that <laughs> is very hard to define. It's very difficult to work with. It's very difficult to remove the need to for validation, which is very human. Um, and one of the ways to do work with it is by through discipline, um, like going against the grain. Like if you can figure out a way to discipline yourself and figure out ways that you're able to do that at little steps at a time, then you'll be able to cope with your creativity. And that's really interesting. Um, those that are less creative and are okay with a day-to-day routine, right? There's like, and that's natural to them. There's less desire for chaos, significantly less desire for chaos. There's things, less things that throw them off, especially as they become older, right? But those that desire a little bit of chaos, those that desire a little bit of change every once in a while, um, <laughs> like, uh, you must have some sort of stable anchor to, to rely on, to come back to. Hence why, like, creatives typically... Uh, emotionally benefit the most from having stable marriages and relationships. Actually, there's a big study on that. (laughs) Yeah. So it's like creative. If you're especially creative, you are definitely the one to um, emotionally and psychologically um, uh, benefit the most from having a anchored relationship, right? Whatever that is. And that should be a goal that you may want to have in order to further uh, continue your creative endeavor. Mm -hmm. Um. So anyway, this is way beyond my pay grade and beyond my understanding. It's been a long time since I've looked into the psychology behind creativity. So I'm, I'm going to admit that I'm kind of getting into the, the part where like, I don't know much about this, but I do think that it's, I'm a little bit in the weeds here. 
But I do think there's, it's a lot deeper and it's a lot more personal um, and it's a lot more nuanced than we think. It's not just like, do you have it or not? I think it's, it's, the point is, if you are very creative, it's difficult to be a creative as an engineer because at the end of the day, many times an engineer will be called to not be creative. Mm -hmm. Just to just be efficient and help someone else be creative. And if you can change your perspective where like, yes, right now I'm a button pusher, but I'm helping the knowledge that I have right now is helping someone else be creative and you can feel fulfilled by allowing someone else be creative. If you can change your perspective in that way, I think it'll be uh, beneficial in the long run as an engineer. I think one of the most underrated views about engineers and creativity is this. Um, if you're ever interviewed to actually engineer for a studio, you might have a sit-in session as your first book session where the owner of the studio or one of the higher-up engineers will actually sit in and evaluate your ability to actually record efficiently and quickly and how you condone yourself in that session. Now, something that they're not looking for is your creativity. It's your ability to actually understand the technology because understanding the technology does not actually mean creative. That means you know what you're doing. You're capable of the work. Now, creativity in a button pusher situation is actually still possible. You know, I kind of like how you brought up DK about how in some cases you need to play your role. You don't need to be the one recommending lyrics or anything, but part of the creativity in the engineer's hands that still exists is understanding the difference between a good take and a bad take, understanding when something maybe could have been inflected better just to, for it to be a little bit of a better take, not as a vocal coach, but as somebody who recognizes a good performance versus a bad performance and actually helping the creative get the most out of themselves. And so you can say that that can be a little bit black and white, but a button pusher wouldn't care. You know, part of what we do is still creative and the vocal chain and your ability to hit, you know, command space is not the creativity part. So that's that's kind of like the big thing here. Like, you know, because we're, we're talking a lot about like the psychology of it. Right. But the question goes back to are we avoiding creativity by using this the same chain as everybody else? You know, sometimes that is literally our job, but creativity surrounds that. Our job is merely the, the role that we've been given. The creativity is what we do within that role. We have limitations to what we can do in our role, then great. You still have creativity in what you can do within those limitations. Yeah. Um, the last thing that I want to say about this, so we've talked about the roles of creativity in engineering and producing and when is the right time to be creative, when is not potentially right, and the nuances of that. That being said, um, I want to talk about, we, we even talked about um, good habits for things to focus on if you are creative. Mm -hmm. and, and again, like we've talked about this many times in the past, like if you're high in openness, if you're very creative, if you cannot have a regular job, but you must work for yourself as a freelancer, mm -hmm. right? Um, it is so much more important for you as a creative to develop exercise habits <laughs> yeah, as well as to create discipline habits, even if it, especially if it is so unnatural to do so. Yeah. I, mean, I know a lot of people, it's like, I don't like having habits and stuff. It's like, that's why it's important for you to have habits. Like yeah. that's more, if like, I hate rules. It's like, that's why it's more important for you to create rules um, mm -hmm. for yourself. And so, I, I want to be clear about that. And, and I think that this should be empowering because the more disciplined you are, like I've said in the past with on the, uh, many times throughout many episodes, is literally in order to do well in this industry is you just have to reply to emails on time. Okay, outside of being good at what you do, right? Yeah. To a baseline degree. Not even like the best. To a baseline degree. If you reply to emails quickly and efficiently, if you uh, turn around projects quickly and efficiently, if you write emails professionally, if you text people professionally using professional language, right? If, if you're just like a good communicator and are highly efficient and organized and like a good, yeah, like you will do super well over time. You do that for years, you will do well. It is impossible for you to not do that well. And, and we're, what we're talking about is not someone that is like, 
can turn on the ability to be a good communicator and to be highly reliable. We're talking about someone where being reliable and a good communicator is part of their character, where mm-hmm. their habit they've been practicing on their habits of doing so for so long that they no longer make the mistake of turning, like make the mistake of forgetting to turn that switch on. Like there, yeah. like, does that make sense? Like, yeah. uh, we've talked about this, like kindness, kindness is not a choice. If kindness was a choice, then you're not kind because yeah. that means you consider the weight of what it was, what it would cost to be unkind. Like a true kind person is someone that never had to think about being kind. Right. And same thing with like being reliable. Like if you're someone that's like, I'm reliable most of the time, except about once a month, I forget a meeting or so. Dude, I'm here to tell you. You're not reliable. <laughs> someone is reliable isn't someone that misses a meeting once a month, right? Someone that is reliable is someone that is reliable is reliable all the time. That's like the definition of reliable. Like there's n- you never miss, mm-hmm. right? It's not like oh this person has a misses once a month or a couple times a year. You know, no. It's someone that is truly reliable never misses. And yes, I I say that being aware that people can be hard on themselves, but I actually think to a certain degree being hard on yourself a little bit is okay. I think if anything, as much as I believe in mental health, I also don't think the true solution is to get rid of all insecurity. I don't think zero percent insecurity is the answer. Mm -hmm. I think to mitigate and properly cope with this little amount of insecurity that you have left. 10 to 20% insecurity is great. Pushing yourself because of that 10, 20% of like guilt and shame is actually great, is really beneficial, practical. Like, but if you have too much, it's another thing. Like if you're unable to cope or you develop really unhealthy coping, coping mechanisms or you really hate yourself because of it, that's too much. But I'm, I do think that getting rid of it 100% is also not the solution, right? So you should, as a creative, feel the responsibility to develop these cope, uh, healthier coping mechanisms. One of the things that I think is really important, something that we don't talk about too much, is the human desire to feel validation. This is something that's been thinking mm-hmm. about a lot, especially since um, Travis uh, brought it up on the One yep. Million yeah, Travis Ferentz brought it up in the one million. This is something that we've talked about many times, something that I've thought about in the past, but um, just like the timing of bring it back, bringing this topic back into my life, I think is really important. Another thing that I think we isn't talked about enough is that Lou and I have a podcast. So we practice this every week. And I will say this is the few things that I have a leg up on. Every week, Lou and I practice uh, being creative and articulating our thoughts every week on a mic. Yeah. We get validated by each other, by the audience. And so thus, I am able to be not like able to decide when I'm not be able to when when I can't shouldn't be creative. I'm able to mm-hmm. cope with that. Like it's not a big deal. I'm not starving for validation or starving to be understood because we spend a lot of time articulating at least once a week, okay? Yeah. If you do not have a healthy practice of talking to someone, talking to others and articulating your own thoughts, or if not with someone else, the practice of writing, writing and expressing yourself to yourself, which is so healthy, um, which by the way, is one of the habits that you should have as a creative. um, Then there's, and if you can remove, that's one of the healthy and practical ways to remove this need to feeling this this human desire to being like this need to feel understood and this need to be validated, then you're less likely to have a Freudian slip. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, <laughs> less likely to be in a recording session and be able to um, reliably, uh, you're more likely to be able to control yourself. Because I do agree, like some of us, many of us, myself included, it's like this strong level of desire to be understood or to be validated accidentally, uh, like that desire um, uh, subconsciously made me speak up when I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Like it led me to wanting to be part of this creative process even more because of a desire to be understood, because of this desire to be validated. And and, and, um, if you check those feelings by articulating and feeling validation or um, uh, feeling understood through writing or through speaking with other people, uh, especially with those of opposing thoughts and be able to articulate your feelings. Like I think those will actually help you um, be yourself and retain that self-discipline uh, in the moments where it's like that desire. It's like, say something. That worm rhymes with God, like with 
heaven, heaven rhymes, use heaven. I'm like, why can't you see that? You know, and you're like screaming at yourself and you're like, why did I speak up? Why did I say anything? I shouldn't have said anything. That wasn't the right time to be creative. Like that voice in your head, you'll be able to control it a bit more if you practice articulating um, yourself. Sorry, does that make sense, Lou? It does. It yeah. does because I hate to say it, but what was screaming in my head while you're saying that is like, it's like me and my stupid ass ADHD moments when I overshare. And then at the end of the conversation, you're like, I shouldn't have said as much. I, yeah. I spoke way too fucking much. So it's learning to control those moments where you're like, mm, yeah, I, it's, this is not the moment for that. So in a creative space where maybe you're hired to be uh, a button pusher, knowing when to speak up and actually say something versus like, hey, this is not the moment for that. Yeah, I agree. So another thing, if you were highly creative to cope with this desire to be validated and to be understood is like, if you don't have a podcast or if you don't have a really reliable, consistent group of friends oh, that pushes no plugin back on that your has ideas, your name on it, psh, you're not on one of the preset list. Psh, yeah, you're dude, not is, even is, real. <laughs> The one of the ways to cope with that, honestly, genuinely, I think this is actually really good advice is to start a journal and just write free flow. And especially if you're creative, you're going to, you're going to feel stupid when you're typing something down or writing something by hand. And then eventually like your soul is just going to pour into the pages and you're going to like articulate yourself eventually. Like after, however, sometimes it's like immediately, sometimes it's after 10 minutes of just writing nonsense. Um, This is a really good practice. And again, the ability to articulate is one of the strongest things that you can one of the strongest weapons, you can either look at it as a weapon or a shield or however you want to look at it, is one of the greatest social skills that you could possibly have in this world. And what's really frustrating, and this is something that we, we, um, I'm starting to recognize more and more, is that the more that I learn to articulate and the better that I feel about my ability to articulate, the less self-conscious I am about being misunderstood because I'm able to articulate better yeah, and because I have a, a larger word bank or whatever, ability to... Um, to speak what I'm saying. I've practiced through the podcast or through writing, right? Or through mm-hmm. reading. Um, in my day-to-day life, I feel a less and less desire to assert myself. Like, like for example, um, in a very practical anecdotal sense, you read this, uh, this, this thread, thread mm-hmm. and you felt the need you felt that, and I don't mean to call you out of this loop. No, no, it's okay. It's like, I, I you, see this as the 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 my issue with social media. Yeah, yeah, and this isn't yeah. necessarily bad. I think this is yeah. very normal. But I'm I'm kind of using this as an anecdotal reference. Yeah, like yeah. I find I find the need to feel like you have to respond and say something to it um, is projecting something internal, yeah. right? And this I think this goes beyond anything. It beyond it, this is not just you, Lou, but like mm-hmm. I do find that the more that I practice articulating, especially those with opposing viewpoints, and Lou, you're really good at pushing back. I I'm only friends with people that push back on my thoughts. I I hate I hate friends that only agree with me. I the cannot yes stand men. that. Yeah, I hate that yeah. so much. Um, especially because I know that I'm especially assertive and I'm aggressive in my opinions. And I so think when it we seems first started like, talking yeah. to each other, I even said like do you want to play devil's advocate? You're like, I have a question. I'm like, do you want me to be devil's advocate? Yeah. And that's, like, that's how that. we would start our conversations. And, and my aggressive nature and opinionated nature obviously gets people to think that they're scared of pushing back. Yeah. Right. But also, but at the same time, like those people that are strong enough or, or willing to push back are my favorite people of all time. Yeah, I want that, people to change my mind. I want to say that that's like the number one thing that I appreciate about like my wife, Anna, where like I may say something, I may be inspired and then she'll push back on it. And some people might see that as like, dude, she just pushed you down. I'm like, no, 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 no. She raised the point I did not see. And yeah. from a viewpoint that I did not have on this topic. And now I'm considering it. And now that I've considered it, my opinion has actually changed because there's validity in what the other person is saying. So like, I, I, I know what you mean by like, when you have friends that just say yes to everything or just like, oh, that's cool and have no opinion. It's like, no, like, what, what's your opinion? Like, let's have a conversation. This back and forth is what feeds growth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and lastly, like, uh, so we talked about the role of creativity in the position. Sorry, mental recap here. Role mm-hmm. of creativity in in producing engineering and when to balance that out. How to deal with your creativity and how to cope with your creativity. Um, how to uh, further 
learn to use your creativity, like with writing and articulation, practice and sharpening the blade of your creativity. So when it does need to be used, it will be used well and slice well, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I also think the one last thing is um, uh, this, especially those that are creative, if you are high in anxiety, Mm -hmm. it is proven time and time again, you need to sleep, have a regular sleep schedule, go to bed at the same time, create some sort of stability, even if you don't want to. This is not a personality thing. This is a decision, a decision to make. And, um, you know, make sure that you eat breakfast. Um, and another thing too, it's like, especially for those that are creative, um, exercise benefits a ton. Not only has in many, there's a lot, there's a little bit of debate here, but not only is uh, IQ, one of the greatest ways to prevent your IQ from decreasing over time, like literal IQ from decreasing over time. Um, but it is a way to maintain mentally strong and focused uh, and to give yourself endorphins in that way, to manage anxiety. I have to ask, just so, because I, maybe I misheard. You said IQ is important to reduce yeah. the loss of IQ? Yeah, so exercise is the best preventative to uh, is the best preventative to stop IQ from in- in- decreasing. I see. Okay, I okay. So I did misunderstand something. Okay, that's on me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if, if you exercise, it will stop your IQ from decreasing over time. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, so because uh, your brain uses oxygen. Yeah, your brain yeah. uses oxygen. So anaerobic and aerobic exercise seem to uh, be effective at staving off cognitive declines across a yeah. lifespan. All right. Uh, and then, yeah, so that's it. So manage anxiety, advice for creative people. We've, yeah, so that's it. There's, again, I, we recognize where I'm not a psychologist. I'm not. I'm just like reading stuff and, uh, and from speaking from personal um, experience. Personal experience. But at the same time, it's like we do need to be aware when is just because you're creative doesn't mean that it is your job to be creative constantly. Um, it is very important as a human to figure out when is the right time to be creative, when is not. Just like with the desire to teach. When is this a teaching moment? Is this not a teaching moment? And I think that I'm still learning, but in retrospect, I think throughout my 20s, I spoke up way too much outside of the podcast. When it's my job to speak up, or like in therapy, when it's my job, to, when it's I'm paying to, to speak up, right? Yeah. Um, outside of those positions, I wish that I was silent more often. And lastly, like we had a, two parts of uh, 48 Laws of Power, which is interesting. Um, it can be perceived as a, a power move to stay silent. It is a power yeah. move to stay silent. That was one of the laws is like knowing when to talk and, and um, when to speak up. Uh, and it's like, uh, and I think a lot of people that are especially more introverted don't have an issue with not speaking up, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, uh, so, but that being said, it's like, um, I think that was the point of this episode. The point of, of your topic that you brought this up, Lou, is like Mm -hmm. recognizing and utilizing what you recognize. So becoming aware and having the tools, which is the goal of any sort of Eastern philosophy or, or therapy as well. It's like building awareness. Mm -hmm. than creating tools that work for you to cope in healthy ways. So I think we talked about that. We built awareness, knowing when to be creative, when not to be creative, what is the role of creativity to a baseline level within within the standard operations of music production, and then uh, how to cope with your creativity. There you go. I think we did that. Yeah. Sweet. Um, Any other thoughts, Lou? Yeah. Yeah. One, um, I think something that I saw in the comments was, uh, and I brought this up off the air, which was, uh, FOMO being a part of why we wonder if we're being creative or not, or if we have enough creativity when we don't have the right gear, because some people took the question and said, well, I like the U87 anyways. It's like, that wasn't the question, but we see what you're saying now. You know, um, we say it a ton of times on the podcast, but I I always feel the need to reiterate this because um, 
This is something that I'm constantly weighing the last couple months, and I've been weighing it for years now. Um, I've been saying that I want to buy my own console for live audio, um, not because I just want to have a console, right? I've never wanted a console for the studio, and every time I say I want a console for the studio, I say I can buy that way later down the line. I, I, it's not an immediacy need. It's not even a need at all. It's it's an accessory. But for live audio, it's that's very different. You need a console for live audio because what the fuck are you going to do? Run Pro Tools and mix it from there? That's stupid. Um, but um, there's a difference between needing a console with certain features and wanting a console with certain features. Like, what features do you actually need and things of that nature? And, uh, you know, there's some people who are going to say, like, brands like Digico uh, are, like, the top line and the Avid uh, consoles for live are the top of the line, this and that. And because of that, you might be like, well, if I don't have that, I'm not a real front of house engineer. The same way some people say, if I don't have a 1073, a C800G and a CL1B, I'm not a real recording engineer. Or I'm, I'm an artist, but I don't have a real vocal chain that I'm recording out of. When the reality is, we've seen it time and time again, the tool does not make the artist, the tool does not make the engineer, the tool is merely a tool. It has no bias. It doesn't make you any better if you have it in your hands. Um, and the reason we I know a lot up, of people that have all the tools because they somehow and came they into still money. Suck. And, yeah. Like to, to put it bluntly, they still suck. Yeah. Um, and people try to buy tools to make to up fix for the that. insecurity. Yeah. Insecurity, yeah, is, but it only deepens it further. Exactly. Which is why you go back to the whole mentality of fundamentals, like get treatment first and focus on which type of monitoring you're going to focus on. Like if you're going to do headphones, then you don't need treatment. But if you are going to get speakers, then put a good chunk of that into treatment. Um, but, you know, going back to the whole idea, don't FOMO and end up buying your own. Don't fuck up your mindset by saying, well, the reason the question is, uh, are we avoiding creativity if we use that chain is more because so many people assume that that's the chain you need anyways. Like, that's the standard. It's like, well, sure, sure. Socially speaking, that is kind of a standard. Is it the standard for good quality audio? No. Good quality audio comes in all size, shapes, and forms. Um, for instance, um, I use a Lynx Hilo. Uh, it's pretty standard in the mastering world, I guess you could say, but there's still people who prefer Burl. There's still people who prefer uh, Apogee. There's still people who prefer just any other brand. You know, uh, DK is a good example of this. Uh, a lot of people would say, well, why don't you have an Apollo? He uses Motu. Uh, Motu is one of those brands when he told me about it, I'm like, you know, I'm kind of surprised you went with that because not a lot of people go with that. I've had Motu before and I've liked it. I know Motu in my eyes have been similar in the space as like RME. And I know a lot of people really like RME, but those that don't aren't familiar with RME see RME as like this kind of weird brand. Like they make interfaces, but that it seems like they're like really advanced interfaces for very specific niche people. But the reality is, listen to DK's mixes, listen to my masters. You'll see that no matter what we decide to use, the quality is there. You know, it's the, the, your ability to be good is not based on the tool. It's how you use the tool. So your creativity is not based on the tool. It's on how you use the tool. You know, so don't FOMO out and think that you're not creative enough. You're not a good enough artist. You'll never be able to match the artist that you're trying to work with in the future because you don't have the same gear. Creativity is what makes you stand out as an artist, not yeah, the tool. It's interesting, again, going back to the process of building awareness and then creating tools to cope with it, right? Is mm -hmm. um, I think the first step everyone has to do recognize is that recognizing when that very human, psychologically human process of like FOMO and insecurity is being projected and mm -hmm. to recognize where that's coming from. I think that's really difficult for a lot of people. Um, and it may need some third party help to recognize, especially... Mm -hmm. Never mind. I'm going to stop it there, right? The So I think that's the first step is like, I don't think everyone recognizes when their desire for new gear, when they're feeling that they're not good enough because they don't have the right gear. It's not about the gear. It's something deeper that you're projecting. Where is yep. that insecurity coming from? And then trying to articulate that insecurity and recognizing when that, um, that, uh, 
that naturally defensive part about you. Because like when someone is defensive, that happens unconsciously. They mm -hmm. become defensive and show their insecurity unconsciously. It's not like, I'm going to choose to be defensive right now. Like like that joke that we said earlier with the guy. Yeah. It's like, so are you insecure about your height? And the first thing that they said is like, first off, I'm, I'm taller, taller than you, than buddy. You. <laughs> like that wasn't a decision that they made. That was a reaction from something deeper going on. And yeah. I think we do this a lot and we are, we sometimes I think our minds in order to protect itself uh, naturally chooses to avoid confronting that awareness. Mm -hmm. I think that is a very natural process. And I think it's difficult to confront that level of awareness. It is, it is hard to deal with yourself recognizing how mediocre you might actually be yep. or how weak you might actually be. That, that is actually a difficult process, but it is a very important process. You cannot go beyond that if you don't first process those feelings about yourself and process that defensive nature, that natural defensive nature that has been working to protect your mind. Like it's been functional. It's been protecting you from uh, what your mind has been interpreting as potentially harmful, right? Yeah. And then the second thing, after you become aware of it, is, is building coping mechanisms that are healthy to recognize that. So mm -hmm. for me, and what we've talked about before, was like learning to articulate yourself, whether it's, and I've done uh, assertiveness training with myself where I decided to be an asshole and practice being an asshole and just saying my thoughts and becoming assertive, right? Um, choosing the right friends that allow you to do that. Um, and being okay with losing friends, right? That don't allow you to do that. Um, uh, yeah, uh, like and, and to a certain degree, if you're at that level, maybe the level is to start talking about politics, but focus on not getting emotion, like practice not getting emotionally um, triggered, right? Mm -hmm. To like having, trying to practice that self-control. And like, it does take, it does take, practice like this mm -hmm. isn't something that some people are sure are talented with this but this i think i think more cases than not this is a practiced especially if you're like a normal ass human being if you're not a psychopath then this is a practice skill and you, you might think some people are better at that than me oh dk is just better at not caring about what gear he has than i will ever be don't minimize the the mental work that i've put in to get to this point Exactly. Oh, DK's just naturally a better runner than me. He's just way healthier than me. Don't minimize how much mental and emotional work I've put into getting to this point. Mm -hmm. Just because you're not there yet doesn't mean that I didn't work and it wasn't natural for me. What a silly way at looking at life. Yep. It's like, imagine, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. When, when especially right now, with because uh, I think this this episode releases on election day. So right right now people are freaking out, right? And this mm. is a huge deal. This is a big thing for me and, and something that I'm recognizing more and more. If you hear somebody on the news say something that is undeniably horrendous about an, uh, one of your opponents and you're like, their first thought, and this is very natural, your first thought is, oh my gosh, that is such a nasty thing. I cannot, this is so dangerous for everybody else to hear because if anybody else understands this and they, this, this speaks volumes about the American people. If you go into it, because like I, so your assumption is subconscious, you're saying I'm smart enough to see through this bullshit but I think that on average, everyone is dumber than me and incapable of seeing this for what it is, which is bullshit. They're uh, incapable of seeing it beyond face value, but I'm smart enough that I'm smart enough to be able to see this for beyond what it is. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is subconsciously, the average person is dumber than me and I am special and I understand that everybody else, that I am, I am smarter than everybody else. And thus, I do not trust the average American to see through this bullshit. They're not going to see through this bullshit. That, that, okay, this is just one anecdotal way of putting on this, but I, I find this fascinating. I think that if your subconscious defense mechanism is to automatically think that people are dumber than you, and thus it is your job to create awareness <laughs> and to speak on, I think that speaks volumes for you as an individual. Mm hmm and hear me out on this, maybe one of the signs that you are absolutely fucking average intelligence because those that are actually really smart are really insecure about their intelligence. 
mm-hmm. pretty frequently, most times than not. Uh, <laughs> and naturally, naturally will be like, Oh, that's BS, though thus most other people will see this as BS as well. So there's like less fear mongering. There's less fear. There's less immediate um in this anecdotal uh presentation, there's this less immediate uh um false narrative that's creative where every I'm scared because everybody else is gonna believe this BS and that I'm one of the few people that can see through this. No, like if you're actually smart, you'll realize, oh yeah, most other people will see through this BS as well. And there's gonna be a lot of loud people that don't. But I have faith that most people are going to see through this. See it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think that's like a really good indicator of where you stand for yourself and where, what the things that you project. I've I've been thinking about this a lot because of the politics. It's like, wow, you really believe that most people are dumb, and that you are special intellectually is like really interesting way of coping. Yeah. I find that very fascinating to see that, and I think it's also very subconscious. Like, again, like most of these things, like someone that truly has a narcissistic personality disorder will be incapable of recognizing that for themselves. Like, and these people are typically usually very smart and aware. Like it takes a smart person to be an effective narcissist as a disorder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and so like, you'd think that they eventually become aware, but no, it's, it's, that's like one of the things is, is creating awareness is significantly more difficult than people realize. So uh, sorry, this episode went into a really weird tangent in a completely but, different direction, but I think it's very important. Yeah, I think it still went well, though. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's really interesting because, like, you also have to be brave enough to recognize that, like, right now, I say a lot of dumb things. And I've said, we've done this podcast for years, for four years. Mm-hmm. And we've both said very dumb things that if the DK and Lou now listen back to, it would be like, ooh, if that was wrong. And I feel very strongly against that now. Yeah. But it's almost important. It's, it's like, it's very important to like go through that process. So to counteract what I said earlier, it's like, it's important as long as you build awareness, it's not bad to go through these moments of unawareness. Like if you, you, those moments of unawareness can become building blocks and become steps to awareness. Uh, It's like a good thing if you are working on that, but if you're not, it's not a good thing. It's just, you're just dumb and it's cyclical. Uh, And, and yeah. And personal, personally, I really genuinely believe that if people learn to practice, if people practice articulating more and really being able to uh, say how they're feeling and to say what they want to say and feel satisfied with, and, and personally feel satisfied with the way that they said it, um, I think that really helps with coping, like with coping with creativity and like that need for validation. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different ideas that I've been having about this topic, but I, I think that this is a definite curse that most creatives will have to deal with over and over and over again. And it's just, you just have to nip it on the butt and become aware about it, become aware and then deal with it. This is just part of the human creative experience. Yeah. Be cool. All right. Sorry, I think I said my piece. My bad, y'all. This is the classic <laughs> mixing music podcast tangent that, <laughs> that like, yeah, uh, I think those that listen this far in know what to expect, though. Yeah, yeah, that's true. My bad, y'all. <laughs> um, yeah, I have this weird thing where I'll go on like crazy tangents and I'll get like really passionate about it, and then I'll feel really insecure about it afterwards. I'll be like, "Oh shoot!" Like, <laughs> remember, remember earlier I mentioned the, the ADHD urge to overshare, and then at the end of it, you're like, "I didn't need to say all that." <laughs> yeah. So it's I, like, I understand yeah. the feeling all too naturally. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for listening to the Mixing Music Podcast. If you want uh, more episodes, go to mixingmusicpodcast.com slash exclusive. I'm sure that if you're listening on Spotify, you'll, you can visually see all the episodes that you're missing out on and how cool those topics are. Yeah. Go to mixingmusicpodcast.com slash exclusive to sign up. We have a we already have a bunch bunch of people signed up listening to the exclusive episodes that are available natively on Spotify. Or you can uh, subscribe on Spotify and listen to them natively on Apple Podcasts if that's your preferred part preferred platform. Because if you sign up on uh, you you have to sign up via Spotify, but they email you an RSS link that you can use to upload into Apple Podcasts or, or whatever, if your podcasting platform is something else that allows you to import a separate custom RSS feed, then you can listen to that through that platform as well. So that, once again, that's mixingmusicpodcast.com slash exclusive. Um, 
And if you want to see what episodes you're missing out on, all 200 plus episodes of the exclusive episodes that are become available immediately and they're ad free, um, go to the Spotify, look at the podcast on Spotify and see what episodes you're missing out on. They're really, mm-hmm. really good, I think. And uh, James and I do a great job on that one. And on that note, happy mixing, my friends, and stay saucy. Stay saucy.